fair warning, this video is just going to be me showing off. Not that that's that different to my previous videos, but in this case, I assure you, there is no educational content. In 2014, I built a games console. I designed and built the hardware, I wrote the BIOS, and I wrote all of the games for it. And obviously it was all programmed in assembly. Instead of a composite video output, it has a vector display. So yes, it's the old trick of drawing pictures on an oscilloscope in XY mode. Although I used reasonable quality DACs for the output, they're only 8-bit, and the op-amps are meant for audio, so the slew rate is really bad, and uh, kind of defeats the point of having a vector output at all. I wanted it to use existing control pads, but when I was building this I only had one NES pad and one SNES pad, so the uh, two-player games are a little bit lopsided. Also, I couldn't easily get hold of the vector, the socket for this type of connector, but what I could get were extension cables, so all I had to do was chop those up to be able to connect to it. But enough talking, let's turn this thing on. Hold on. What a great game to start off with. Anaconda. It's like Snake, but, you know, involves trigonometry. The bright dot in the top right corner is the beam idle spot. The console has no intensity output, so the only way to modulate brightness is by changing the dwell time, and between frames it rests the beam at the 0, zero position. It gives a pretty good idea of the load on the display routine. If that point starts to get dim, it means there are too many sprites on the screen. The sound hardware is a very loose approximation of what you might find on a Game Boy. It's got three square waves and a noise channel. The noise channel really is just that, it's gating the output of a reverse bias transistor. I'm sure no one will be surprised to learn that I wrote a JavaScript utility to convert MIDI files into the correct binary format for the cartridges. Since the cartridges are EEPROM, that's electrically erasable, non-volatile memory, the high score table is stored onto the cartridge. The routine that does this is part of the BIOS, it's used by several different games, but in this case we didn't score highly enough to earn a place on the scoreboard. Now if you recognise what that first game was from, then you can probably guess what the next game is going to be. Yep, Retro Racer. It's a two-player game, and since I couldn't find the soundtrack in MIDI format, I used another popular MIDI file instead. Here we encounter one of the big problems with the system. Since there's no colour output, it's normally quite hard to keep track of who's who. In this case though, I'm, as you can see, demonstrating this by myself. I'll pick up the other controller. One of the striking things about Retro Racer is that the motion is supposed to be very fluid, the walls are very slippery, and I only partly managed to implement that because the processor is just 8-bit, the collisions are single precision, and the tiles are about as pixelated as they look. Speaking of which, the system can load any map that we desire, but true to the original, it only has one map available. If you thought the calculations there were tricky, it gets even harder for the next game in the series. 
So hard, in fact, that I didn't finish it. Astrolander has gravity and momentum and collisions and the whole screen zooms in and out as you play, which I almost managed, but I'd given myself a hard deadline of only one week per game, and I missed the deadline on this one. Besides, the next game is going to be a lot more exciting. But before we load this up, um, let's talk about what's actually happening when we load a game. The processor is 8-bit, it's an AppMega chip, and the AVR architecture is interesting. It's what we call a Harvard architecture. The program data, that's the flash memory on board the chip, has a separate address space to everything else. So the RAM, the working memory, and the peripherals all exist in a separate place to the program. And similarly, the program on this cart uh, has its own address space. No matter what we do, we cannot get that chip to run code directly from this cartridge. So what's going on? What we do have the ability to do is write to our own program memory. So when the game cart is plugged in, the first thing the BIOS does is copy the entire cartridge onto the flash memory, and then jump to there in order to run it. If you think that doing it this way is stupid, you'd be right. Anyway, uh, to maintain the illusion of running from the cartridge, there's a pin change interrupt that fires when the cart is pulled out, that kills it, and goes back to the insert cart screen. I have a weird compulsion to get these games as accurate as possible. And if you're not familiar with it, you might not realise that the motion of the Pac-Man ghosts is far from random. Each of the ghosts has its own behaviour routine, and in my recreation, I've stayed as true as possible to the original. Blinky, the uh, red ghost, is the simplest who always runs straight towards Pac-Man, at least during the attack phase. Pinky runs ahead, aiming for a few squares ahead of where Pac-Man is facing. Inky does something similar, but this time mixing things up a bit, taking the difference between Blinky and Pac-Man's positions to try and perform a pincer attack with the other ghosts. And Clyde, the orange ghost? Well, he just does his own thing. All of this is slightly wasted though, since there's no colour information and all of the ghosts look the same. But now you know that although they look the same, they all have their own personalities. Writing this game was an excellent exercise in using the memory displacement instructions. These aren't unique to app mega chips. lots of processors have something like this. It's basically about setting a pointer to memory, and then asking to read and write data to a fixed offset away from that pointer. And the reason you'd want this is so that you can implement tabular data. In the case of the ghosts, they've all got different properties, things like their x and y positions, their sprite, and the direction they're heading. Even though there are differences in their behaviour, the bulk of the ghost handling code is the same. By having a table in memory of all these properties, we can set a pointer to the first row of the table, and the code can use the displacement instructions to work on the properties of the first ghost. Then we move the pointer ahead to the next row, and run exactly the same code again to do the processing for the second ghost. These techniques are a bit different to how you'd implement something like this in C, but once you get used to it, you can make the code really efficient almost unnecessarily efficient. Before we load up the next game, I have to explain that throughout this project, every day that went by, my ambitions were growing. You know, I started off knowing almost nothing about electronics and almost nothing about programming in assembly. And nothing about how computers work. I mean, how they really work. So halfway through I was thinking, you know, look how far we've come. What could take this to the next level? And the answer is, obviously, 3D. I didn't even have a game in mind, but I chucked together a couple of matrix transform routines, we've already got the trig tables familiar, and BAM! Wireframe 3D models on an 8-bit processor drawn on an oscilloscope. Well, by the end of the project, I'd kind of forgotten to make use of these 3D routines, so, not to let them go to waste, the only thing I could think of was putting them on the Tetris title screen.
wall kicks and delayed auto shift. These two things are what make or break a Tetris implementation. The wall kicks are what happen when you try and rotate a piece when it's in contact with a wall and an in-place rotation wouldn't work. The delayed auto shift is about what happens when you hold a button down. The first press shifts it by one grid space, then after a fixed amount of time it'll start to auto shift and the delays between auto shifts are different again. Lucky for me, every last detail of the different versions of Tetris has been extensively documented, so all it takes to implement these things is attention to detail. The scoring, the rotation origins, the bag from which the next tetromino is chosen. All of these things are implemented as true to the original as possible. Because, well, if you're going to do something, do it right. There are a couple of games I made right at the very beginning. Nothing special, there's paint, which was mostly just to help me while I was developing the graphics hardware. And yes, this is a brainfuck interpreter, which again, this was after I'd written the text drawing routines, I needed something to test it. But there's one other game. One game I wanted to have a go at, you know, something really ambitious. Might not sound all that complicated, it's just a 30 year old platforming game. But the physics of Mario, the behaviour of our little jumping plumber, recreating that is an entire project in itself. Getting Tetris to feel right was one thing, but Mario, and I say this as someone who used to be quite active in the Nintendo fan game community, Mario, everyone gets it wrong. Or very few people get it right. The mechanics are so counterintuitive. From when you press the jump button to when you first release the jump button, at that period of time, gravity is reduced. There are distances which can only be jumped when you're running at full speed. There are distances which can never be jumped. There are heights which you can only jump to if you have a certain horizontal speed. All of these things are an effect of the exact physics behaviour and the exact constants which govern the behaviour. Get any one of them wrong and the levels are unplayable. As you can see, I managed to implement Mario's behaviour and the level is loaded but there are no bad guys and lots of things are missing. Since I didn't implement death, falling into a pit means you fall until the Y coordinate wraps and you fall out of the sky. And there's no end game either, so at the end of the level, the routine starts to load the music data into memory as if it were level data. And perhaps this is a metaphor for life. When we overcome the hurdles and we finally reach our goals, all that lies beyond is a collection of broken tiles. Or maybe it's a lesson about obsessive behaviour. If you take things too far, the world will fall apart. You might be wondering how I was able to produce all of this on such a short timescale. For Mario, I think I only spent three days on it. And these aren't full days, mind you. Despite everything, I did have certain responsibilities, which meant that I couldn't channel every waking hour into the project. Much as I might have wanted to. Honestly, I've never told anyone about this. But I suppose it's time that I come clean. Before writing these games in assembly, I prototyped them. In JavaScript! for Mario and Pac-Man and bits of the others. Anywhere the logic was going to be difficult, I made a quick demo in a language where I was more comfortable. And then, once the behaviour was nailed down, I could focus on translating that, by hand, into assembly. There was still a lot of difficult assembly programming to do, but by separating the difficulty of it being assembly and the difficulty of it being a complicated behaviour, the whole thing was, well, I wouldn't say easy, but easier. Did I need to make the Pac-Man prototype as polished as this? No. People frequently underestimate the amount of effort it takes to document projects. 
I'd say writing up a project page and filming a video about it often takes more effort than the actual project itself. But it's so valuable though, being able to go back and see what you did and what you thought at the time. In this case, this thing has sat on my shelf for about four and a half years, and I feel it may have been better to just do a half assed project page about it at the time, rather than waiting until I'd forgotten all of the details. Still, I'll uh, put what I can on mitzar.com, including some of the JavaScript stuff, and I guess the assembly source code, although it might be horrifying. I've not looked at it yet. Conclusion. If you're thinking of learning electronics, building your own games console with a one-of-a-kind architecture and programming all of the games for it yourself in assembly, it's already been done. But don't let that stop you. It's really fun and educational. I'll cheer you on. Believe in yourself. Believe! <laughs>